Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I have a sore throat, so I'm using this. But apparently, pop stars do it, so it's cool. Um, what I'm talking about um, is architecture. But I'll start off by saying that um, I'm also, as you would guess, being a professor in a university, passionate about education. And um, the TEDx uh, youth event that happened a few months ago, plus this event, um, I think are really what the future of education is all about. Um, it's the kind of group and organization that um, I think will drive the future forward in education. But as I say, I'm talking about uh, architecture. Uh, and what I'm talking about is inspired by um, Xi Jinping, uh, president of China. Um, I guess you know he's president of China, so I guess that's a piece of useless information. Uh, but uh, last year, he said he was worried about the amount of uh, strange and alien architecture being built in this country. So um, I'm going to try and have a look at what he means and what, uh, what we're talking about when we're looking about the future of architecture. Part of the way I'm going to start is with this building, which is the Sydney Opera House. Um, it's one of the key sources of inspiration for uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, in several ways. Uh, this is a projection onto the Sydney Opera House by a group of young artists who do this kind of digital projection onto um, works of uh, particular architecture. So here we've got a light show being projected onto the Sydney Opera House and these young artists projecting themselves uh, all over the Opera House so that you can watch this uh, live uh, at the scene. So I'm going to be using that as a vehicle to look at who innovates and how um, what is alien and strange and what is really innovation uh, and um, right at the end my current passion which is to innovate through interactive and user responsive design so because I'm an academic I have to do some history for you so sorry about this but you don't have to take notes um, you can just listen and there isn't an exam paper um, the place I'm starting is here this is uh, a design for a museum it doesn't look like a museum and this is the whole point the architects for this were Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers. They were the youngest architects entering this international um, competition. Uh, they won the competition, and obviously the first thing you do after you've won a competition of international importance, uh, Richard Rogers uh, rang his mother to say, Mum, I've won. Uh, it was the first major project that these two had won, and they were up against uh, famous architects from around the world. So, why did it win and what was the controversy around it? Well, you see where it is. It is in a part of Paris that needed regeneration but has historic buildings. Uh, at the time, there was one president who supported the idea of building this building. There was a change of president halfway through and he almost stopped the project. It's now become one of the most iconic buildings in Paris for two reasons. It's technologically innovative uh, because it uses a kind of cast steel that hadn't been used before in architecture, which meant you cast the steel into certain shapes, reheated it, and suddenly it became incredibly strong. And that was used for the outside elements that you can see over to the right, called the gerberets. They were meant to be like pieces of art in their own right. So it's technologically innovative. It was innovative because up until this time, uh, Museums look like this thing on the right, the British Museum, using classical architecture. Or the museum built around the same time in the USA, the Kimball Museum. These were designed on the idea that what's in the museum is valuable, so you want to protect it, you want it to be inward looking. They, uh, at this project, Richard Rogers uh, and Renzo Piano, now famous architects. In fact, Renzo Piano was talking in, in Shanghai this, uh, yesterday. Um, they had this idea that instead of doing a building like that, museums and art centers had to be projecting themselves to the outside world. So they built the model at the top to show that it's meant to be a transparent machine, a factory for ar artifacts. And down on the plaza, you'll see bottom left, crowds gathering, because this is now a performance space. So instead of a building that um, indicates to people things are valuable in here, keep out, it's come into this building, you're welcome. The idea that th this kind of refers to um, was written about by uh, an author, Robert uh, Hughes. 
And what he talked about was the shock of the new. If we're going to innovate, then sometimes we have to change what we do quite radically. Radical change isn't always right, but sometimes in order to make a significant change, we do have to be radical. And that is the new, and sometimes it is shocking, and we have to try and work out whether shocking is good or shocking is bad. Uh, and so that's part of the debate about architecture. The building here, the Sydney Opera House, is a building that almost got stopped for similar reasons. Politicians thought it was too expensive, too radical, too, too different. It's now iconic. The building was designed by a, a, an architect called Jorn Utzon, very famous. And the way it got built was facilitated by an, a famous design engineer called Peter Rice. Peter Rice's job was a difficult one because at that time, computers looked like the ones bottom left. The mobile phones that you have in your pocket are more powerful than that computer in that room. And so they were designing with pieces of kit that were very limited, and so they had to come up with a simplification idea. The great simplification and the great leap of thought was to say, let's make this doubly curved, complex shape out of a single hemisphere, then it's easy to calculate the geometry. And that's what the uh, images on the right show. So that's what Sydney Opera House is famous for in the architectural world. What it's not famous for is the more important thing in my mind, which is the glass walls. Jorn Utzon wanted to create walls that you could see back out into Sydney when you came out of a concert, you could look out into the, into the city. The problem was, glass is very brittle. Um, it's very weak in that respect. It's strong as a material, but its weakness is its brittleness. So at Sydney Opera House, what he had to do, uh, Peter Rice and colleagues, was put these big red lumps of steel in the way. Peter Rice hated that, hated that he couldn't uh, deliver the architect's innovation. So for the years afterwards, he worked on how to solve this problem, and finally, about 10 years later, solved it at a building called La Villette in Paris, where instead of having big pieces of steel holding glass in place, they invented a connector that was radical. So it was having the problem there at Sydney Opera House led Peter Rice to be an innovator uh, and an inventor and work with his colleagues to get rid of the, the material that holds the glass in place and make it as minimal as possible so that we can now see out of buildings. So it's a going from um, the one bottom right to the one on the uh, top right. This is a major development, and it's the kind of thing that we now take for granted. Uh, this is an exhibition um, honoring the work of Peter Rice as a great inventor and a great developer, uh, where on the left you can see a model of the, the connection that was developed, and on the right a more detailed look at, uh, look at the joint. So when you're walking around today, you, you probably don't even notice how significant this is. We just take it for granted that we now have glass walls that we can see out of and that there aren't glazing bars getting in the way, there isn't lumps of steel spoiling the view. So on the left is just a building in Liverpool where um, I was a professor of architecture, uh, and on the right is um, a bank in Shanghai that you've probably not even noticed has got this piece of innovative design in. So, um, what do you do if you, if you take that innovative idea with glass um, uh, that started at Sydney Opera House and the work of Peter Rice with his colleagues um, such as Martin Francis, who was a product designer who wanted to make um, the possibility to have a material which wasn't brittle but was strong and flexible and mix it with Apple computers, one of the other great innovators uh, in the, the past uh, few decades. Uh, what you end up with is Apple stores looking like this. So the staircase in typical Apple store is a spiral staircase like this, where the material holding up the staircase isn't concrete, isn't steel, isn't wood, it's glass. And so now the development has taken place so that the material that's holding up, bottom left, and the material that's connecting uh, uses this very small connector that was developed and it all began because of Sydney Opera House. And where we're up to today is the next generation, and now we take for granted the fact that this thin sheet of glass that goes over iPhones, smartphones, or whatever, and we take it for granted. 
but this is an outstanding piece of uh, modern technology that we're using in everyday life that starts with a group of designers thinking, how can we make this material uh, more flexible, more reliable, uh, without it being so brittle? So, uh, Xi Jinping said um, he was worried about strange architecture. Um, in case you're worried that uh, professors don't get reading to do, I got given his book last month to read, so uh, that's my reading. I have to do my homework as well. So even archit architectural professors have homework. Um, so he, he was worried about strange or alien architecture. Um, I pointed out two projects, Boberg Centre Pompidou and uh, Sydney Opera House that are both strange. <laughs> I think that's what he was talking about. They're funny, but I wouldn't like to work in one, and I wouldn't like to live in one. Um, okay. okay, I think the audience reaction kind of measures the fact that you don't regard that as innovative architecture, unless it's designed for children. Um, this is uh, what I think is innovative architecture that is possibly regarded as alien. This is a, a building in Graz in Austria, built for the cultural capital year. Um, each year a capital in uh, a, a city in Europe gets chosen as a cultural capital. Um, in this case, this building was rejected by the first committee that considered the, uh, the entrance, and then a few years later they ran the uh, competition again, it was rejected again, and third time it won. Suddenly people have become open to the fact that we could have something like this, and Colin Fournier, uh, Colin Fournier and Peter Cook, who designed it, kind of predicted what Xi Jinping was going to say. They said this a lot earlier, and they called it the friendly alien. They had this idea of this floating object in the sky. Uh, the, the, the people walking by in, in red are looking up at it. Even the model for it, instead of doing a typical architectural model with fancy machinery, they made it out of a pizza base and pasta. So that was the, the model for the, the, the building just to show how radical it was. It's set in a, a traditional city, but it uses all these uh, technologies, and um, cities like Suzhou and Shanghai have very innovative light shows. But this is clever because, firstly, the way the skin is uh, wrapped over the top of the lights, and secondly, the lights aren't special lights. They are the kind of lights that people in their Austrian homes have in their kitchens or their, their rooms. They're just standard lights that everyone has. What's clever is hooking them up to a computer and not switching them on and off, but turning them down to 10% up to 90, down to 10 up to 90. So you can either have what seems to be off and what seems to be on. The, the modeling of the skin is clever. What you do is bottom right, you model the skin of the, the, the building um, which is number one. Then the computer drives a piece of machinery that cuts the sheet of material out, the piece of acrylic, and then you get another piece of machinery that heats and folds it into the right position. So that's how the skin is done. But this is the, the facade. The skin wraps over these lights, then behind the, the, the skin are these lights, and it's called Bix because of binary pixels. It is not called Wheaty Bix, which I found lying around in Suzhou uh, yesterday. Um, so this is the Kunsthaus in Graz. And it's not a, a, a complex kind of um, graphic on the outside, and that's part of the challenge. It's an art house, so it's taking graphics, which is only the same resolution as the icon on a computer screen, and trying to make it interesting. So they put ballet dancers, uh, hands moving over the building, or other simple graphic objects there. So what we usually t mean when we're talking about alien is curved forms. Some forms are biomorphic, some are biomimicry. Google headquarters looks like this, and you'd expect it to because people talk about it being futuristic. But what we really need to decide is, is it innovative? Um, there are innovative ideas that are doubly curved. Um, Dennis Sheldon, working for Frank Geary, worried about the problem of, if you make curved surfaces, the easiest thing to do is to make them out of triangular facets. This is very expensive on material and time. So he worked out how to make them out of rectangles which is a great innovation. But it, th that kind of innovation has happened years before. You don't need computers to do that. You need an intelligent human being working out how to do this 
Fray Otto produced this in 71, and he did this magnificently efficient structure simply by making a model of it upside down using chains, which you'll see on the right, and turning it the other way up, and then you get the perfect shape to be efficient. So, um, how do we design to be innovative? Uh, we're always designing pretty much for a context. One of the, the best designers in the world is from Suzhou, uh, grew up in Suzhou, Io Ming Pei. The Museum of Suzhou is a great example of you take some cultural, um, local form uh, and reinterpret it. So the building on the left reinterprets traditional Suzhou architecture. On the right, you see traditional Chinese scene replicated. And what he does is, even in corridors, replicate the geometry and rhythm of a traditional Suzhou building. It's not that he can't. Uh, work in other ways. One of his greatest pieces of innovative architecture was at the Louvre in Paris, where he had to add a gallery. It's an almost impossible task to add a gallery to a building as important and as classical as this. He had the great idea of putting another basic uh, primary shape, the pyramid, made it out of glass and put the gallery underneath. So now um, the gallery has this pyramid, which is what you enter the gallery uh, via, and you let the light in by an inverted pyramid. So who, who would you get to make that work? The person who worried about how you make glass transparent, Peter Rice. I work at this building as an example of taking a local feature as an inspiration. In this case, it's a piece of local lake stone. The designers thought, OK, we'll make a reference that way, take a cube out of lake stone, and this is what it looks like. My colleagues find it very difficult to navigate around because none of the floor plans are the same, though. So they don't think it's innovative, they think it's annoying. Um, the final part is uh, me saying what I'm currently interested in. I'm working with some researchers back, back in Liverpool. The idea of the internet, we've all got media uh, that we carry around with us. Why can't buildings be media? I taught Mark Goulthorpe some years ago, and 10 years ago, I can't take any credit for this, he developed this, which is an interactive wall where you can blow on it or make a, a, a hand gesture near it, and the shape of the wall will respond to whatever you do. So now we can make buildings be interactive. This is the kind of thing we're working on at the moment, is to try and make them responsive to the mood of the people in the building. Uh, this is a good example from Spain, where you can uh, type a digital message onto a catapult or slingshot and fire it at the building, and the building works out where the, um, the uh, message hit and sends the message to whoever it was that the message was intended for. So we've got interactive facades. So what, it is, what is it that we're doing in architecture? To, are we being al producing alien or, or innovative? It depends on our motives. And what most architects and other professions like environmental scientists, health workers, politicians are doing is trying to make the world a better place. Basically doing what the Olympics do, which is have the idea of burning flame of hope for a better world. So I'll finish with what I think is the most inspiring piece of architecture that I've ever seen, also uh, undergoing a digital protection by this bunch of um, innovative young artists. Okay, thank you. didn't need it after all.